Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining the mentoring session this morning. Uh, we just have one student here with us, Siddhi Kenu. Thank you, Siddhi Kenu, for joining the, uh, the mentoring session. And I want to thank all the faculty who have uh, joined this morning. Um, before we begin, can we just uh, uh, pause for a word of prayer? Can I ask Pastor Roshan to lead us in a word of prayer, please? Sure, Pastor. Thank you. Father, we come before you this morning. Lord, we, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. Father, we thank you that your faithfulness sustains us every day, Lord. Uh, Father, we submit this time into your hands. Even uh, this be a time of learning, uh, a, a, a time of new revelation of you, of your word, Father. Uh, we submit this entire time into your hands. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Roshan. Uh, you all are familiar with uh, what we do during the mentoring session. We, uh, you're free to, uh, you know, ask your questions, questions uh, regarding what you are studying in class, your courses that you're studying, or you have any questions regarding, uh, you know, the what you're studying from the Bible, your quiet time, any doubts, mm -hmm. uh, any questions pertaining to life, uh, your spiritual walk with the Lord. So this time is open for you to ask your questions, your queries, doubts. Uh, please feel free to unmute your mics and ask your questions, or you can type it in the chat section. you have any questions, uh, please feel free to unmute your mics and ask them. Or you can even type it in the chat section. Yeah, yes, yes, morning, ma'am. Good morning, Herbert. Yes, please. Um, I had a question. I was thinking Je Jesus after after resurrection, um, he appeared to, to the disciples and other people. So I wanted to see the way maybe he appeared to them. Was he appearing to them like as a spirit or or like the way he used to, he came like the other normal Jesus whom they are seeing day by day. Uh, were they seeing him like in a form of like a spirit or they were seeing him live and he was talking live to them? Yeah, I was wondering about that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for your question, uh, Herbert. Would any of the faculty like to answer that question? Anyone? Uh, yes, uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, uh, uh, Herbert and pa Pastor Selena. Um, I just want to uh, share what, uh, that, uh, you know, we, we see that uh, Jesus also asked for Thomas to put his hand into the, um, you know, the place where uh, he, he was pierced. So uh, it was a physical body that Jesus appeared in. We also see that he had breakfast with his disciples. So um, after resurrection, it's a glorified body, um, uh, which, uh, you know, I, I believe Jesus had. It. So he was not just spirit, but he had a physical body. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, Pastor Nancy. Anyone else would like to add to that question? Hey, Pastor Serena, I, I just wanted to bring up a, a verse. Um, I'm just looking at Luke, uh, uh, Luke 24, verses 20. Yeah. 
37, 37. So I'll just read. They were terrified and frightened, and supposed we had seen a spirit. And he said to them, Why are you troubled? And why, why do doubts arise in your hearts? Behold, my hands and my feet. flesh and bones as you see I have. So uh, this is just actually reiterating the point that uh, Pastor Nancy had also brought up that it was a glorified body but uh, did come in physical presence as well. Thank you. Thank you uh, Pastor, G uh, Pastor Nancy and Jean. Um, uh, yes, Herbert, we know that, uh, you know, like uh, Pastor Nancy and Jean mentioned that uh, Jesus had a physical body uh, that could be touched and handled after his resurrection. He was seen uh, by his disciples. We read this in Matthew chapter uh, 28, verse uh, 9. Uh, we also see that he appeared to his disciples on the road to Emmaus. Um, uh, just like in any other traveler on the road, we read this in Luke chapter 24, verses 15 to 18, and verses 28 to 29. We also see in uh, read in Luke chapter 24, verse 30, that he took uh, bread and uh, broke it, um, and uh, you know he ate a piece of broiled fish uh, to demonstrate uh, very clearly that uh, he had a physical body and he was not just uh, a spirit. Uh, we also see that, uh, you know, when Mary uh, saw him in uh, uh, near his tomb, uh, she thought he was a gardener. We read this in uh, John chapter 20, verse uh, uh, 15. Uh, John chapter 20, verse 20, he, uh, he showed his disciples his hands and his side. He also invited uh, Thomas to touch his hand and his side. We read this in John chapter 20, verse 27. Um, and in John chapter 21, he prepared a breakfast for his disciples on the, uh, on the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, so we see that, um, you know, he also says in Luke chapter 24, verse 39, uh, see my hands and my feet, that it is I myself, handle me and see for a spirit has not flesh and bones as you see that I um, have, okay? Um, and even Peter says uh, uh, about the talks about this in Acts chapter 10 verse 41 where he says that we ate and drank with him after he rose from the uh, dead. So all of this very clearly uh, shows us that uh, Jesus was not uh, uh, spirit uh, being when uh, you know he after he resurrected from the dead, but he had a physical body, a glorified body, uh, but he chose to have uh, the scars, um, uh, that, uh, you know, he, uh, when he was crucified, uh, that also gives us an assurance that uh, when we, uh, you know, um, rise again uh, from the dead, we will have glorified, resurrected bodies just like Jesus, uh, but we will not have the scars and the pain uh, of this earthly life. Uh, but Jesus chose to have the scars uh, just just showed uh, you know uh, of what uh, the sacrifice that he had made on the cross. I hope that answers your question, Herbert. Yeah, thank you very much for that wonderful explanation. Uh, I had uh, another question for Pastor Jax, but he I can see is not yet connected. But maybe Monique, Madam Monique, will check it for me. Uh, in the final assessment for discipleship, there was number three and number four for e-learning. Uh, he asked uh, the question, but never put like a space for for putting the, the answers. So um, it is question three, question four. So there is no, there is submit and the total marks, but there is no, uh, there is no space for putting the, the, the question. So maybe... Madam Monique will check it for us in a discipleship. Sure, Herbert, I will check in the chamber. Speaker, yes, a Herbert. bit louder. Yeah, uh, yes. Monica has made a, a note of it and she will check uh, with it uh, soon after the call and she will help make sure that that's uh, corrected. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you for your question, Herbert. Do you have any more questions? Okay. Uh, 
No more questions. Uh, thank you, Pastor Nancy and uh, Jean, for uh, answering Herbert's uh, question. Uh, we have. Uh, Uh, a question from uh, Siddhikenu. He says, there are some people who are having demonic uh, possession over them, but they cannot recognize them easily, and they come to church regularly, and the manifestation happens. It's also very rare, so I want help regarding this. I want to help these people with demonic possession, but we are not able to recognize them. So how can we pray for them like their behavior is also normal? Okay, uh, so it's basically he wants to know, uh, uh, you know, how to identify people who are demon possessed and also how to help them. Okay, so can one of our faculties uh, Help Siddhikinu with the, his query, please. These are people who are demon possessed and they come to church regularly um, and they rarely manifest. But uh, how do we identify such people and how do we help them? Anyone, uh, any of our faculty would like to answer that question? Uh, yes, it can. Uh, one is, you know, um, one is, uh, I think uh, we need to be clear in our minds that um, deliverance does not always need to have manifestation. So, you know, uh, when demons leave, it doesn't mean they always have to make a noise. Uh, they, they doesn't have to be with, you know, all uh, uh, manifestation. Uh, the fact is that um, people are constantly being delivered, setting, being set free from demonic oppression. Uh, so, uh, talking about believers, we're talking, you know, we're talking about a church situation, believers. So we we will not say that believers are possessed. So we do not say that because believers cannot be possessed. But we're talking about oppression. That means um, there is an unlawful demonic activity and in their lives, and so believers are oppressed. And many times, uh, perhaps almost every Sunday, in 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 the presence of God believers are being delivered and this happens in a very quiet way i mean there's no there's not necessarily any manifestation but evil spirits uh, leave uh, ground is gained retrieved and believers you know are, are moving into places of victory in their lives and this happens simply because of the ministry of the word the presence of the holy spirit the presence of god in that place so I think uh, the answer to your question is this, that uh, our focus should not be on the manifestation, but our focus should be on seeing believers walking in progressive, increasing measures of victory in their lives. If that is happening, then that's what we want. And that's what God wants. He wants uh, his people to live as overcomers. So uh, the focus should not be the manifestation, but the focus should be our believers living victorious lives, are growing and increasing in victory in their lives. Uh, and uh, that, that's, that's what we should be looking at. We look at the fruit, uh, not the, you know, the, uh, the ex expressions. Now, of course, there will be times when manifestations happen and we should address it. Uh, but, um, uh, you, know, the you know, I think what I want to emphasize is that deliverance often takes place without much noise. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Uh, Siti Kenu, does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. It gives me a very good clarity, ma'am. Okay. Thank you. 
Uh, we'll move on to our next question uh, by Elisha. He says, how should couples treat infertility in marriage? Uh, so Elisha's question is, how should couples treat infertility in marriage? So uh, could I request uh, Jean to please uh, help in answering this question, please? Sure. Uh, thank you, Pastor Selina. Uh, yes, I'll... Um... So when, when we look at couples with infertility, uh, I think we we'll, we'll look at it in two ways. Again, I don't think there is uh, um, any specific uh, chapter or verse in the Bible that does not allow couples to progress with treatment. But nevertheless, uh, I, I think the most important thing is for couples to continue to um, believe and pray in faith uh, about uh, opening up of the womb. I've, I've personally seen many couples who've been infertile for years with uh, just continuous meditation of the word, believing in the word, having, um, uh, you know, had, uh, had b become fertile. Um, but having said that, so I think that's the first and foremost thing, the go-to to continue in faith, to continue praying, to continue uh, seeking the Lord, because the gift of children is a reward. Um, so that's one part. The, the next is to be able to take treatment. And I think it's perfectly OK to um, take treatment for, uh, for fertilization. And there are many I mean, sciences developed in a way that can help couples have children of their own, biological children of their own. So taking on those options are, um, are OK. Um, the next option, of course, is adoption. If none of these um, take place, if they do not have biological children of their own, is to go in for adoption. Of course, that requires a preparedness, um, both in the spirit level as well as in their ability to take care and uh, come in terms of taking on a child that is not biological. And uh, because we also live in a social culture, to be able to get the support and um, buy-in of other family members, extended family members, would be something that is also an option. Nevertheless, it is uh, the heart that God prepares for whatever method or source that one would choose to have children. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you, uh, Jean. He also has a follow-up question. Elisha has a follow-up question. It's a, his question is, is, mo is it moral for couples to open up to alternative reproductive health, uh, say IVF or surrogacy? So, uh, Jean, would you like to help with that, please? Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think we had bought this question of surrogacy a couple of uh, we. And in fact, I was the one who brought this up with uh, Pastor, and uh, I remember Pastor also saying that uh, you know these are alternative medical treatments, and uh, to to do something like that is is okay. There isn't anything that would uh, uh, keep us from uh, from using whatever medical technologies or expansions that has come about. I also personally think that it is okay to have to go through treatments of uh, in vitro or uh, surrogacy. I, I, I leave that open to anybody else who may have uh, other thoughts. Thank you very much, Jean. Uh, any of the other faculty would like to throw any light on uh, Elisha's two questions? Yes, Elisha, you have your hand up. Yes, ma'am. Yes, thank you very much. Um, I, I personally want to contribute to the, the question. On the issue of surrogacy, I, I, Pastor Jane, thank you very much. I, I agree and share, and share your thoughts on all the response that you gave. I, I am a bit... Um, concerned with the surrogacy 
Um, I understand that um, fertility or childbirth, as God originally designed it, has to be between couples, a married man and a woman. But uh, if you look at the issue of surrogacy, that is where a third party is brought into the into the equation. So uh, a mother, an external person, has to carry uh, a baby on behalf of the couple. And that is where I find it a bit um, um, on par with what Scripture admonishes. Just like... Um, uh, Rebecca, uh, Ra sorry, Rahel, thought of uh, offering his her maid to Jacob for to carry uh, to bear a children for him. I think is we can consider that as their type of surrogacy, and that is not the original idea of God when it comes to childbirth. So that is why um, I personally think that surrogacy wouldn't be moral for us believers as in the original design of God. That is my thoughts, please. Thank you. Thank you for sharing your thoughts. Uh, Elisha, would uh, any of our faculty like to help Elisha with uh, his understanding and his thoughts? Yeah, Elisha, thank, um, thank you for sharing. I think um, you know, there, there are or there will be uh, lots and lots of questions and things that we as uh, believers will have to think through, uh, and especially as science and uh, medicine and other things advance and uh, be able to do more and more things medically. Uh, there are lots, there are a lot of, you know, ethical questions, moral questions, biblical questions that come up. Um, and so in this case, um, I mean, um, yeah, I, I just want to share, share two points. One is um, uh, when we look at surrogacy, the, the, the seed for the new life is still from the original parents, so, which is different from the biblical incident we mentioned about Jacob and Ryle because there, you know, it's the seed is not from the original parents, but here in surrogacy, the seed is from the original parents and um, uh, and just that the development, the fertilization development is happening externally. So that would be a differentiator. Uh, uh, and then I think at the end of it, uh, because the Bible is silent on many of these issues, um, we I feel that the ultimate or the final decision will be left to the individual believer. Um, you know, like Romans the fourteenth chapter, when Paul is addressing some general things about what you can eat and days and observe, you know, all those kinds of things, general general questions. Um, he mentions, you know, in verse five, he says, let each one be fully persuaded in their own mind. So in matters where the Bible is silent and where we have to make decisions which are not necessarily, you know, sinful, but yet we, you know, it's like, we don't know, you know, we don't know what is the right decision to make. Um, that's where I think each believer has to be fully persuaded in their own mind, based, of course, on what they see in the scriptures and what the, what God is speaking to them, uh, which also means that we have to give freedom within the church to respect each other's decisions. So, so even in this matter, for instance, um, like we, we looked at the three options, you know, there will be couples who just believe the word of God and they have children. There will be couples who believe the word of God and get some medical help and then have children. And then there will be couples who believe the word of God, who've tried medical help, and then finally come to the place where they decide to adopt and they adopt children. And then now because of the advancement of science and medicine, there may be couples who believe the word of God, 
who try medical help initially, uh, who consider adopting children, but they choose not to, but instead they choose to, you know, do something like IVF or surrogacy or something, something different. And then they have children, uh, they have their own children. So in all cases, I think we should just respect uh, the faith on where they are in faith and what, what's happening in their faith walk. Uh, we just respect them. Uh, you know, we appreciate those who believe the word have children. We appreciate or respect those who, you know, in all, in all of these scenarios, I think we just um, let each one make their own journey of faith. As long as they're not doing anything sinful or dishonoring to God, uh, we respect, we should, uh, you know, just, as long as they're staying in line with the things of God, I think that's fine. Uh, that's I just so I just add these two points and uh, what just to think about. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor uh, Elisha. I hope that uh, gives a good explanation for your thoughts. Yes, yes, Pastor Selena. Yes, thank you, Pastor Ashes. Thank you, Pastor Jean. Thank you, Elisha. Uh, any more questions? Anyone has any questions? Pertaining to what you've studied in your course, or uh, what you're reading from your uh, from the Bible during your quiet time, or any questions uh, regarding your spiritual walk with the Lord. Yes, Elisha. Yes, uh, Pastor. This is another question. Um, is on death. Death. Um, I know that the, we, we, we've categorized death into three categories, the physical death, the spiritual death, and then the second death. Uh, my question is with respect to the physical death. Um, as we know from scripture, uh, the wages of sin is death. So um, we've all come to believe that death is consequential as a result of sin. But uh, it is not only humans that die. Animals, the beasts, other animals also die. What sin did they also commit? And um, children who are born, who are born and could not have the opportunity to live out to adulthood and they die, what would be their their faith on the day of the Lord or with respect to their salvation? This, this, are my, this is my question. Uh, thank you for your question, Elisha. Uh, so Elisha is saying his uh, question is regarding physical death. Uh, he says that all of us will die one day, but uh, what is uh, uh, what happens to animals, beasts, uh, of the field, uh, what happens to them, and also to children, uh, you know, who are stillborn or uh, children who die very early uh, before they reach their uh, adulthood. Uh, so what happens to uh, uh, these children and to also, he's asking about uh, the animals. Anyone, any of our faculty would like to help in answering that question, please? Paul uh, Emmanuel, Pastor Paul, would you please help us in answering this yes. question? Yes, yeah, sure, Pastor Selina. Uh, thank you, Elisha, for that question. Uh, okay. Yes, so Elisha, uh, you had mentioned Romans 6.23, which is the wages of sin is death. Uh, just want to bring a little bit of light on that verse. Uh, uh, Paul is writing to the Romans, and the word death uh, in Romans 6.23 uh, is not referring to the physical death only, but also uh, to the spiritual death, or uh, death meaning the eternal damnation, eternal separation from God. Uh, and then he follows it up in Romans 6, 23, saying the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. So uh, so if you put, these, put the verse together, you see that Paul is trying to bring the aspect of, of the spiritual more than the physical. So the wages of sin is death, referring to uh, eternal separation from God. Uh, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Uh, 
So uh, I, I believe that uh, you mentioned about animals and bees. Uh, um, uh, so in terms of uh, their spirit, spirit, uh, there there is no. Uh, I believe that there's no uh, you know uh, relationship or uh, that they would have with God. There's no uh, sin nature in them. Um, so. So the whole fact of that Paul is writing to the Romans, I believe, is uh, uh, the eternal uh, separation from God. Or uh, his question is right there. So Paul, uh, his question was, why is there physical death? Basic, basically, his basic, basic question is, why is there physical death for animals, for babies, for those who have not done anything wrong? So his, his, his question is not, you know, the, the, I mean, so I think we need to understand this question correctly. And as Celine, I think you forgot his why, uh, you know, so the, the real issue is why, why are animals dying? Why are babies dying? Because they haven't done anything wrong. Of course, it's about physical death. So if you could just uh, continue on into that, that would be good. Thank you. Thank you, Buster. Okay. Uh, Pastor, Pastor uh, can you help me with that, Pastor? No, please. Yes, please. Uh, yes uh, thank you, Pastor Paul. Uh, Pastor Nancy, like to share yeah. help? Yes. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, thank you, Pastor Paul, for sharing your thoughts and also uh, Pastor Lina. Um, uh, uh, so I, I'll share a scripture. This is from Romans uh, chapter 8 and verse 21. Let me put us here. Yes, so it, it says because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. So uh, what we recognize is that uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, um, uh, you know, the not just the human beings, but the entire world. So which means everything that makes up this world has been corrupted by sin, which includes animals. No, which um which so which is what is causing a lot of suffering in the world and of course you know death death as a consequence so the sin is not just a, a sin that somebody is committing that's not the only that's not the only understanding of that word sin there Elisha but sin is what has corrupted the entire world and thus um, you know it the the consequence of that is death of humans, death of animals, death of innocent, you know, babies that you've pointed out here, and also all other forms of destruction, calamities that we observe in nature uh, and all of that. So it's because of the corruption uh, of sin that that has, uh, um, you know, tainted the world. And it, you know, but we thank God that Jesus has come to to deliver us from uh, this corruption to redeem not just human beings but also the world. Right, the world will also uh, ultimately be redeemed from the corruption of this sin. So, uh, just some thoughts there, and I, I'm sure others also can add to this. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Pastor Nancy. Uh, any of the other faculty would uh, like to throw some light on this? Yeah, just uh, just to add, you know, so Nancy explained it. And I think Abraham's comment, Abraham Tate's comment also adds to this. So I think one way to look at it is, um, you know, man was put in charge of the earth. The dominion for the entire earth was given to man. And his, so man's fall, you know, so the original sin affected everything. That's all of everything on earth because who was in charge? Man was in charge. So I think you can look at it like this, you know, suppose, um, you know, uh, the head, the head, whatever happens to the head affects the whole body, the, everything under it. So if the, and, and it happens in all, all scenarios, you know, you can think of it in a family situation, you can think of it in an organization situation, you can think of it in a national situation. If the leader makes a decision, does something wrong, impacts everybody under that leader, you know, under that position, person who's in headship. And that's what happened. Adam and Eve, Adam was put in charge. He sinned. So everything under him, he was put in charge of all everything on the earth. So everything under him, including 
all of creation, including animals, birds, plants, trees, all of creation was subject to corruption, as Romans 8, 21 says. And so we have all of these things happening. Thank you. Thank you, Pasashish. Uh, hope that answers your question. Yes, Elisha. Okay, ma'am. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Pastor Ashes. Thank you for the contribution. Um, so, are we? Do we come to the conclusion that, but for the original sin, man would have been immortal per the um, explanation that have we've had so far we can come to the conclusion that but for the original sin man would have been immortal man and the beast of the earth and everything would have been immortal is that the, the case please yes yes there were death you know so um death there was no death right um before the fall uh life would go on perpetually and um the earth would be inhabited. There was no indication that birds or animals would die. Death was non-existent before the fall. So the perpetuity would be the norm. So the answer is yes. And it's something what we see in the new heavens and the new earth in Revelation 22. We see again perpetuity. Man will live forever. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, Pastor. Thank you, Pastor Ashish. Uh, thank you, Elisha, for your question. Also, uh, we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where God says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So when uh, the word image and likeness means just like God. So God was without sin. He created Adam and Eve to be without sin. God is uh, uh, you know, righteous. He created Adam and Eve to be righteous. God does not die. He created Adam and Eve never to die. God does not have sin. He created Adam and Eve, uh, you know, without any sin. Um, God has a mind, a will, uh, and he created Adam and Eve uh, in the same way. So, you know, when he created us in his image and likeness, he created us never to die. Yes. Thank you for your question, Elijah. Uh, Elisha. Thank you, Pastor, for uh, throwing light on uh, Elisha's uh, uh, question. Uh, we move on to... Uh, Herbert's uh, question, which Monica has already uh, answered. Uh, uh, Siddhikanu's question says, ma'am, I just wanted to ask that I saw in the APC uh, college website about the opening of the institute in the month of August for offline classes. Are we also going to have classes in Google Meet like uh, this online setting as well? Just wanted to know. Uh, Yes, so uh, can Pastor uh, Dinah or uh, Monica help with in answering Siddhikanu's query, please? Hi, uh, Shri Pastor Salina. Uh, Sid, yes, we will be having uh, on camp classes on campus and online and at the same time e-learning. So we will be having all three programs running simultaneously at the same time. Okay, thank you, Pastor Diana. I hope that helps, Siddhi Kenu. Yes, ma'am. Okay, thank you. Yes, Elisha, you have your hand up. Sorry, Pastor Diana, you want to say something? No, Pastor, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, yes, Elisha, you have your hand up? Yes, yes, Pastor. Uh, just just a thought on um, the question I just asked and um, Pastor Ashes helped with the response. Um, my thought is um, man, man, was, man was not just made in the image and likeness of God. Man was also made of dust, dust from the ground. And as the Bible says in Ecclesiastes that um, everything made of dust would eventually will have to return to the dust yes and i believe that the physical death is as a result of 
is a, as a result of man made of dust. Uh, everything that is made of dust has no perpetuality. Um, so, uh, in my view, I think man was, the physical man was originally not made for perpetuality, but the, the spirit man, the spirit of God that is in us, which is more of the image and likeness of God, I believe, has the perpetuality, but the physical body uh, does not have that immortality. That is my thought. I, I believe uh, the faculty can help me to be clear on that. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Elisha. So can one of our faculties uh, help us in answering Elisha's uh, uh, question? Please. Yeah, yeah. Um, thank you for sharing that, Elisha. So if you look at, you know, if you look at the sequence of things in Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, the whole, I, which was later expressed in the book of Ecclesiastes. So the whole understanding that dust you are and to dust you will return came after the fall. It was not there before the fall. So the whole understanding and the whole logic that because your dust, dust goes back to dust, it only came after the fall. It was not mentioned there before the fall. So we cannot transpose something that the understanding that we received after the fall to be prior to the fall, that would be incorrect. So if you just look at how things were before the fall, it is true that God formed man out of the dust of the earth. That is true. But that does not necessarily imply uh, uh, mortality because man was there. Uh, the only thing that would cause death, as we know in the first three chapters of Genesis, was sin. So the day you sin, you will die, which of course was spiritual death, followed by physical death and eternal death, separation from God and hell. Uh, so if sin was never there, then th there would never be death. So while it was true man was created from the dust, there would still be no death if there was no sin. So, you know, so uh, I, I think, I think it, you know, if you just stay with consistency, being consistent in our understanding and in our logic, then it would not be right to transpose and an understanding that was that came in after the fall to be in effect before the fall, which is dust you are to dust you will return. So uh, it would not be right to do that. The other thing uh, we need to highlight is the two trees, right? There's a tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and there's a tree of life. What do we know about the tree of life? Well, it was there in the garden. Man was allowed to eat of the tree of life. What do we know about the tree of life? That same tree we find in Genesis, in Revelation 22, which indicates that the tree of life had this property of giving perpetuity to physical life, to life. That's in Genesis, Revelation 22. And that was a tree man was allowed to eat. So I think there was a reason there, right? That for, for God saying, you can eat of this, but not of the other tree. And that tree, which we see, served the purpose of making sure life continued. So I've just placed these two thoughts in response to uh, what you shared, Elisha, just to think about. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pastor Ashish. Uh, Elisha, does that help answer your question? Yes, yes. I, I would think through, I would have to think through the, the the response from Pastor Ashes. Thank you, Pastor, for for the lead. I will read the scriptures, the references, and think through. Maybe the next time we meet, if I have any other question, I will come again. Thank you, Elisha. Uh, uh, Herbert, uh, Monica has answered your query, which you had uh, asked uh, 
some time back. She says uh, that she has checked the course BC 312 and uh, on discipleship and small group and all the questions and answers are set correctly. Uh, those are multiple type questions so you can just uh, select the correct answer. It doesn't uh, require a typing uh, or an input of any answer. Uh, and she also uh, shares a note, all questions have only one attempt. Uh, I hope that helps uh, Herbert. Yeah, oh, oh, okay, Th thank you so, thank you so much. Um, I think, uh, I, th I think I had uh, uh, maybe misquoted the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the course, but uh, somebody can help me uh, the question, uh, the question was saying, uh, give five, uh, it was like, give five simple steps to establish a cycle of continuous learning. So I, I, um, I might have mistaken, we, I don't remember which exactly course it was, but maybe somebody can enlighten where the question was, give five simple steps to establish a cycle of continuous learning so somebody can remind me perhaps who, who, which course was that it is the question i think which we needed to uh, yeah okay. to, to fit in uh yes. thank you herbert uh, pasashi says it's a life skills course so uh, monica will check on that and uh, uh, help uh, regarding this uh, okay we just thank you thank you a mm. couple of minutes. Okay, thank you, Herbert. Sorry. Uh, we just have a couple of minutes, and John Paul has a question uh, from First Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. It says, Nevertheless, she will be saved in childbearing if they continue in faith, love, and holiness with self control. Uh, he's asking if you could share some thoughts on this verse. Uh, some translations also say she will be saved by uh, childbearing. Is it different? So, anyone, any of our faculty would like to? help uh, John with this question. Okay, uh, yes, uh, Pastor Selena, I'll, I'll share my thoughts on this. Um, so here in this uh, passage, the word for save is uh, um, sozo. Uh, and uh, you know sometimes uh, because we we learn about sozo being salvation so much we wonder whether it's referring to salvation spiritual salvation uh, of women uh, through uh, childbearing but obviously we know that there are several scriptures uh, that tell us how we can receive salvation so that's not it but the word sozo also means preserved so uh, the likely uh, meaning of that uh, passages that a woman who is um, giving birth is protected or preserved uh, in that process. So uh, that's that's my understanding. Uh, I, I, yeah, maybe others could add to add to that. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Pastor Nancy. Uh, anyone else would like to add on this? Anyone else? Uh, does that help answer your question, uh, John? Um, yeah, so uh, this is, we can take this as a promise as we, uh, as we pray for uh, women who are childbearing. Um, I just want to just get a clarity on the saved part. Yeah, thanks, Pastor. Yeah, basically here the understanding is that a wife will be kept safe during childbirth uh, in the light of what we read in Genesis chapter 3, verse 16. And like Pastor Nancy said, saved is the Greek word sozo here, which is all-inclusive word for salvation. Uh, but why is Apostle Paul talking about uh, women and childbirth at this time is, uh, you know, again, we need to understand this uh, in the biblical context and in the local context. Uh, Genesis chapter 3 verse 16 says, uh, we know that the consequences of the fall was that women will bear children uh, with much pain. And also if you look at it in the local context, uh, you know, uh, goddess Diana, which was, uh, you know, uh, was worshipped here uh, 
uh, a, a, you know, and uh, was the goddess of the opposites, was the goddess of the, uh, Ephes uh, the, uh, the city of Ephesus, and she was the goddess of the opposites. And uh, so she was considered as a guardian of young uh, children and protected women in labor. But when she got angry, uh, it is said that, you know, her, her arrows brought sudden death while giving birth. Uh, so Dinah was a divinity of healing, but also brought and spread uh, diseases um, and also, you know, would uh, bring sudden death uh, while women were giving birth. So here Apostle Paul is basically addressing uh, another aspect of uh, the cultural influence of the worship of uh, Dinah. But he's assuring uh, believers in Christ Jesus that women who believe in Jesus will be preserved in childbirth. Uh, uh, just like, like he talks in the preceding verses, uh, he mentions like, you know, uh, that men and women have to continue in faith, love, uh, holiness and uh, uh, self-control and, you know, uh, oh, in their walk with the Lord and they will be preserved from every harm and danger. So does that help, uh, John? Yes, Pastor. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Nancy. Thank you, Pastor Elena. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Sorry, we've uh, exceeded one minute. We'll just end the mentoring session. Uh, can I just ask uh, any one of our students to close in prayer, please? Can I ask Siddhikinu to close in prayer? Yes, ma'am. Father, we come to the throne of grace. Lord, thank you for this day you have given us, O oh Lord. Lord, as we have started this day, learning about your word, clear, clarifying all our doubts which we have related to the session, O oh Lord. Lord, thank you for all the faculty. Lord, thank you for all the students who have joined us in this session, Lord. Lord, bless each and every one, O oh Lord. Thank you for this opportunity you have given us, Lord. As we are learning from your word, Lord, it should not be just wasted or just kept uh, as a learning, Lord, as a books, but it should be used effectively and mightily for your kingdom expansion, O oh Lord. In Jesus' name, we ask everything and God's people say Amen. Amen. Thank you, Siddhi Kenu. Thank you all for joining the call, uh, the mentoring session uh, today. Have a blessed day. God bless. Thank you.